Hi everyone, welcome back to Casual Watch Reviews. This is going to be a bit of a different video. I am not going to be doing a review of this watch. As you probably saw in the thumbnail, this is definitely going to be more of a ranting type video or a story time video. This is a bit bittersweet for me because I certainly set out to do a very good review of this watch. I was really, really looking forward to getting my first Spring Drive Seiko, which this watch would have been. If you've been following the channel for a while, you'll know that a couple of months ago, I went to Japan. First time I'd ever been there, and I was absolutely blown away by it. If you're thinking of visiting Japan, highly, highly recommend it. We spent a lot of time in Tokyo, and then we moved around different locations. We went to Osaka, Yokohama, went to Kyoto. But when we were in Tokyo, of course, I had to go and visit the Seiko Museum in Ginza. This is quite an interesting museum. Multiple floors, and it goes through the history of Seiko. And there's one dedicated floor that is all to do with Grand Seiko. And then another one that's all to do with the, the Speed Timers, the Modern Prospects line. Just awesome. They had the TV watch from Octopussy there. It's just a great all-round thing to do. They had a breakdown of all of the, the Grand Seikos. They had actual models there of the early Grand Seikos. Photographs, a lot of information in a display case. I was totally sold on getting a Grand Seiko. I've been obsessing about it ever since then. My one problem that I've always had with Grand Seiko is I struggled to find one that I really liked. If you've seen the live stream, you'll know that I am all in on the spring drive technology. It is one of the most exciting innovations to happen in mechanical watches for a long time. It's always been my opinion of it. It's just that I've struggled to find a watch that I really like the look of. I do like some of the, the sports watches, the more dressier pieces, but one thing that's really bothered me about them is the the fact that a lot of them don't have loom on the hands and I just really like the loom. I know this shows off the Zuratsu polishing and everything but I do really like to see loom on a watch. My date just for example which is arguably a crossover sports watch has loom on it. I'm not sure why they don't put loom on the hands of some of their other pieces and that's something that's put me off. Also the price of them as well. There's definitely a, a leap. There's a lot in that category of Grand Seiko prices when you're talking about five, six thousand dollars for a spring drive. Even though I run a watch review channel I have not got enough money to be buying expensive watches and I realized that I was in quite a lucky position to be able to buy a date just last year and then obviously this time buying a Grand Seiko this year. So I know I'm in quite a lucky position. I've lived in America for about seven years now. And when I moved over, all I had was enough money to buy an old Ford Focus because I couldn't get credit and also the first month of rent. Been a long time to work myself up to buying these luxury watches. Long story short, whilst I was in Japan, we went to Osaka for the day and I saw a 9F Quartz version of one of their GMT watches and I was immediately hooked. Unfortunately, by that time, I really pushed my luck with my wife. We've been in enough watch shops, we've been to the Seiko Museum and by that time she had had enough of looking in watch shops. So I didn't actually get to try that particular one on. Later, when I did the currency conversion, I found out that that watch was going for quite a lot less than what it is available for sale in the US, which did surprise me because a lot of other watches, including the Seiko watches, were actually more expensive in Japan than they were in the US. But anyway, so I passed up on the Seiko. I did end up buying a vintage, beautiful vintage Grand Seiko from the from the late 60s, which is currently just getting serviced by a Seiko restorer who did my Seiko speed timer for me as well. I was completely sold on the GMT, the quartz version. So I went about trying to source one of those quartz versions. And then I found online that there is a spring drive version of the GMT. On paper, this is the perfect watch for me. It's green dial with a green ceramic bezel, gorgeous. It was the spring drive technology. It was a GMT, which after the date is by far my favorite complication. Not only that, but it looked awesome. These retail, if you go into a Grand Seiko boutique or if you're going online to look for them, they retail for $6,200. It is still a current model. I'll get to this point afterwards, the resale value of these watches, but I bought one that was slightly used. It, it definitely had a few scratches on it because these watches have the Zeratsu polishing on them it this is incredible it's almost a mirror finish so I think it only stays like that whilst it's in the box I think as soon as you take it out of the box you more or less scratched it and you just have to resign yourself to the fact that 
the, the polishing is not going to stay that mirror-like finish for very long. So I got this one and it was still in good condition and I bid on it on Chrono24 and I put in a cheeky low bid. I think it was going for $5,000, put in a bid of $4,000 US coming from Canada. By the time it came with the tax, import duties and everything, it was around about the, we'll say 4500 range. I did get a significant discount of what it is online for a slightly used version. This watch in person is absolutely spectacular. If you've not seen a Grand Seiko, everything they say about the Zeratsu polishing of the hands, the dial and indices. I'm showing some super macro shots here and the finishing on these watches is absolutely incredible. And it's not too much either. It isn't too blingy. It really captures the light and the ceramic bezel and the green dial are spectacular on this watch. The bracelet was decent as well because it does have micro adjustments which is unusual for these Grand Seiko models. They typically don't have any micro adjustments on the bracelet, but this particular model did have micro adjustment on it. Why did I end up not liking this watch? Before we go into this, I'll just pause and say, if you own this watch, you probably don't find this bit as annoying as I did. In fact, I found it so annoying that I ended up having to sell it, which we'll talk about later, how much I sold it for and what I bought next. To me, the beauty of Seiko and I don't like all Seikos, I've definitely given some mediocre reviews. I am not a fan of their Seiko mid-range mechanical movements. And I'm talking the, the 4R35, the 6R movements. I am not a fan of them. I don't think they are the best movements that you can get in that price range. I think that compared to a Solita or ETA movements, you're getting, you're getting a more robust movement with, with Solita, for example. They're also... I think surprisingly easy to magnetize. Now Seiko Quartz in that range, I am all about that. I love the speed timers. I love my Sumo that has the Quartz GMT movement in it, even though as you saw in the review, the alignment was all over the place on that watch, but it's still a beautiful, beautiful watch. I have vintage mechanical Seiko chronographs, which I love, but Seiko to me, regardless of the movement that's in the watch, their cases, even on their bigger watches, have always been well balanced and well designed. The turtle feels like a glove when you put it on your wrist. The Sumo case, even though that watch is, is large, it's a large watch, again, fits like a glove. It is beautifully balanced. I usually put that down to, although I don't have any scientific data behind this, I put it down to the fact that the cases to me feel like they're well balanced because the center of gravity is towards your wrist. When you move your wrist up and down or have it by your side, the watch doesn't fly up and down your, your wrist. Or if you're holding your wrist on a slant, it doesn't move so severely that you feel it on your wrist. And this always to me has been a sign of a well-designed watch case. So even if I haven't liked every Seiko watch I've ever owned, I've always respected them for how well designed the cases are. So when this watch arrived, I was expecting it to also fit like a glove and wow was I wrong. The case on this Grand Seiko is so poorly weighted that it feels like it's hanging off your wrist. It feels like the watch itself is pulling from the crystal down instead of it the center of gravity being towards the back of the watch. What does that mean? It means that when the watch is by the side, edge where the crown is digs into the top of your hand. I tried it by tightening the bracelet. I tried it by loosening the bracelet. I also changed the strap on this watch, which caused me another issue, which I'll talk about shortly, but I just couldn't get a nice fit on this watch. Any day of the week, that Sumo, even though it was around the $500 mark, so significantly cheaper, the case on that Sumo is in every way better balanced than the case on this Grand Seiko. As you'll see here, this watch in comparison to my other watches that I regularly wear, and you see that the G-Shock and the Sumo look monstrous in comparison to that watch, but all of those wear, even though they're similar weights, all of those wear miles better than the, the Grand Seiko. I tried this for, for a couple of days and I just couldn't get used to the way it was essentially feeling like it was hanging off my wrist. The only other watch that I've ever had this experience was with a Squale watch a long time ago, and that's because that does have quite a thick crystal on it, and that does hang off the wrist. But I've reviewed, as you've seen, hundreds of watches on the channel, many, many Seikos, and I've never had a Seiko where the case feels so poorly balanced that it hangs off your wrist. So much so, I just 
couldn't live with it. It was one of those things where I knew I would never get used to the feel. You knew it, you were wearing it. And I think the sign of a good watch, no matter how big it is, is when you sometimes forget that you're wearing it. I never forgot that I was wearing this Grand Seiko for the entire two weeks that I owned it. I couldn't live with it. I hated myself for it because not only did I get it for significantly less, it was in great condition. It had one owner. The salesperson that I bought it off on Krona24 was it was a really good experience buying experience but I just knew I couldn't get used to it so what did I do phoned the guy who was from Chrono24 and he asked me whether the watch was in the same condition now this was one of the problems that I had because I'd changed the strap even though I'd used tape to stop it from scratching the Zeratsu polishing is so fine on these watches that the spring bar did scratch the back of the lug, even though I had the tape on it. So I had to be honest. Also, there was a very gross sticker on the back that had some of the skin of the previous owner embedded in the sticker that had to come off. So it was obvious that I'd worn the watch. The sticker was off and also there was a slight mark. I did send photos back and said showed how slight the mark was, but the person that had got it off had got it on consignment. The consignee didn't want it back because they felt like I'd damaged it. And, and I can understand that. It was a bit of pill to swallow. So what did I do with the watch? Well, I did end up selling it, but wow, did I get quite the eye-opener when you sell a Grand Seiko. They really take a hit on the secondary market. I thought I'd got a good deal, and this previous person had bought it new for 6200 because the original receipt was in the box. And then when I went to sell it, I put it on for, well, first of all, I tried to trade it into two popular online watch dealers. I tried to do a part exchange for a Seiko. In fact, I wanted to do a, a one-for-one swap with the version that I actually did get in the end, which was the SBGN029, which was the Quartz version, which was the updated version of the one that I'd seen in Japan that I wanted. Those retail for 3300 So I offered the watch to a popular online marketplace and said, could I trade, basically just do a straight swap. What my figuring was is that they would make the commission on the watch that they sold. I'd be paying full price for it, 3300 So they'd be making their, whatever the margin was on that. And then they'd be making $1,500 because they were regularly selling those watches on their website for 5000 And it looked like they'd sold a few. But that was my thinking. They might do a straight swap for this. They low-balled me to the point of it. They wanted to offer 2500 I had basically paid 4,500 the week before and I was being offered as trading value 2,500. And you might say, fair enough, they either didn't want the watch in stock or that's just the nature of the beast there. They're assuming the risk and so on. Then what I did was I tried to sell it. I knew I wanted to get this quartz one, so I ended up putting it on eBay for what I paid for it. Like, I ended up putting it on eBay for $4,000. Not a sniff. I had it on buy it now, not a sniff at all. I was getting offers of, in the 2000s, I was getting offers of 3,000 and it was to the point where in the end because I knew I wanted to get this other Seiko still on its way here so I'll do a review when it arrives but I'd managed to find that brand new for around about a thousand dollars less than its RRP so that's coming from Japan I'll do an updated video on that with a review so I was like okay well I'll take a little bit because I saved a little bit a little bit of a flawed economics should we say because really it was a it was a loss however you looked at it i ended up accepting an offer for 3500 so after ebay took its uh, ebay fees now are they're practically astronomical i don't know how they get away with it but it was going through their authentication process so i ended up netting about 3100 the two or three weeks worth of ownership the watch depreciated in real world terms to me about 1300 dollars so that was a very very bitter pill to swallow unfortunately i certainly can't afford to lose that amount of money on a watch but i knew i couldn't live with it the way that it was i knew i knew i wouldn't get used to the way it wore even though i still love the idea of grand seiko and i do have another grand seiko on the way which i am hoping that that case isn't as poorly designed as the case on the gmt that i bought i could have tried these on but there isn't a Grand Seiko boutique near me, except for there is one, and I know the guys in there quite well, and I knew that I didn't want to pay full price for a Grand Seiko. I knew I didn't want to buy one at retail because of the way that they depreciate, so I felt really bad about going in there and trying one of the watches on and then walking out, and then seeing that I bought a watch pre-owned that I tried on the store. There would have been an opportunity to try on this one that was coming, but I ended up just taking a punt on it, and I'm hoping that it does fit well. The moral of the story 
free. I should have tried it on and then worn it for a little bit, couple of hours or whatever to try and get used to it before I took the sticker off and then kept swapping the straps out to try and get a better fit on this watch. I should have done that and then I would have been able to return it through Chrono 24. Definitely an expensive lesson learned. So there you go, it has a little bit more of a story time, but hopefully you found it interesting. Let me know in the comment section down below and I'll do a few more of these, maybe tales of watch collecting. As always, appreciate you watching. I'll see you next time on Casual Watch Reviews.